Boodle, what's that? I think it's something like a router. It's a router? Mm -hmm. I think it's a server. A server? What's a server? A server? We're going to learn about servers in this video. Mm -hmm. What's that over there behind us? Uh, a laptop. A laptop? Which one do you use? Uh, a laptop, rather. You use a laptop rather than a server? Mm -hmm. Now, in a previous video, which I've linked here and below, I explained a little bit about servers and clients. But Poodle, don't you think it'll be better if we practically demonstrate yes. what those are in a network? Mm -hmm. And to do that, we're going to use Cisco Packet Tracer. Is that good? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, let's do that then. Now analogies are okay, but it's much better to demonstrate this practically using Packet Tracer. So let's actually build a network together and I'll show you how clients and servers can work together and I'll show you that a client can also become a server. You could have two laptops, one providing a service to another laptop. So the laptop can be a server in some cases or it can be a client in other cases. Okay, so in Packet Tracer, I'm gonna to go to End Devices and I'm going to select a server and add it to my topology. I'll select a traditional PC and add it to the topology. Now, these are symbols or representations of devices. Physically, this is a server. Physically, that's a laptop. But logically, that's what they look like. These are, once again, just symbols in an application like Packet Tracer. In networking, we use network diagrams to explain what a network looks like. Another example would be here, where I'm using an application called GNS3. So here's a Windows server, and here's a PC. Notice different symbols for different types of devices. I could change the symbol if I wanted to. So in this application, I simply select Change Symbol, and then I could specify another type of symbol to represent a device. And notice there are many types of devices shown here. But as an example, I could say this is a server cluster, if it was a cluster of servers. The point is, is that a symbol is simply a logical representation for a physical device. In Packet Tracer, if I click on this server, there's a physical representation of the server. And then I could once again change the symbol or icon used to represent that server. Here's the physical representation of the PC. Notice Ethernet port right over there. So again, this is a logical representation of a device. Now these two devices can't communicate with each other. We either need to communicate using a physical cable or we need to communicate using the air. So what I'm gonna do is select connections and I'll select what's called a crossover cable. A crossover cable allows two PCs to talk directly to each other. In the old days, we had to use what was called a crossover cable to allow PC to talk to PC. Now today we don't have to do that. I'll talk later about auto MDIX. This used to be a problem in the old days. It's not such a problem these days. Notice the interfaces have gone green, but in Packet Tracer, if I delete that cable and then use just a standard Ethernet cable, notice the interface is down because Packet Tracer still expects you to use the right cable. So once again, I'll delete that cable and I'll select a crossover cable, copper crossover cable, and connect fast ethernet on the PC to fast ethernet on the server. So there you go, I've built a network. That's an example of a network. It's a logical representation of a physical network. Okay, but to allow these two devices to communicate with each other, we need to have two things. We need to have an ethernet address or MAC address that's pre-built into network interface cards. So a manufacturer will burn a MAC address 
onto a network interface card. You can change MAC addresses, but generally you don't have to. They are globally unique. There have been cases where there have been duplicate MAC addresses, but in general that isn't a problem. Every device has its own MAC address. So if I look at this PC and go to config, go to fast ethernet zero, here is the MAC address of the PC. You can see your MAC address on a Windows computer as an example by going to control panel, network and internet, network and sharing center. Have a look at your adapter settings. So as an example, this Wi-Fi network adapter has this MAC address. That's its physical address or MAC address. You'll see something similar on an iPhone or other devices. Every device that communicates on physical ethernet or communicates on Wi-Fi is gonna have a MAC address. We don't have to configure that again. That's configured by default by the manufacturer. On the server, fast ethernet zero, Notice here's the MAC address of the server. But what I'll do is change that. So I'll change the MAC address. This is a 12 digit number in hexadecimal. Now I'll discuss hexadecimal and the details of this later in the course. But for the moment, just notice there are 12 numbers there, hexadecimal numbers. So that's the MAC address now of the server. On the PC, I'll change the MAC address as well. And I'll make this a bunch of ones. So triple zero one followed by eight ones. Now again, you don't have to change the MAC address. I'm just doing that to make things simple. Now the second thing we need is an IP address. Typically in networks, a server, which could be your home router, will be allocating IP addresses to your PCs using a protocol called Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol or DHCP. So DHCP is allocating IP addresses to your PC. I can see that here by opening up a command prompt. And if I type IP config, an IP address, in this case IP version four, is configured on my Windows laptop. So this Windows laptop has received an IP address automatically from a DHCP server or it could be configured statically. You can configure IP addresses statically. In our little network, we don't have a router or another type of device, so we have to manually configure the IP addresses. So on this first PC, I'm gonna give it an IP address of 10.1.1.1 and a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. Now don't worry too much about IP addresses. For the moment, just understand that we've con configured a MAC address, you don't have to do that, and I've configured an IP address. You don't have to do that if you've got two Windows laptops, they can automatically communicate with one another. Here, because we're using Packet Tracer, I'm configuring the IP addresses manually. Okay, so if I go to desktop and open up a command prompt, I'll make this a bit bigger, and type the command ipconfig, what you'll notice is this PC has an IP address. I'll do something similar on the server. Let's give the server an IP address of 10.1.1.2 and a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. So on the PC now, I can use a special application called ping to verify connectivity to the server. Ping is basically sending a message saying, hello, are you there? And then the server's replying back, yes, I'm here. And the PC is saying, hello, are you there? And the server replies back, yes, I'm here. So basically, it sends a, the PC sends a message to the server saying, please reply if you're there. And the server replies back saying, yes, I'm here. And it's used just to verify that the server is up. Is it there? Is it working? Is it turned on? So on the PC, I can use the command ping 10.1.1.2. And as you can see there, we are getting a reply from 10.1.1.2, the PC's IP address is this, the server's IP address. Use the command ipconfig to see it, make this bigger, is 10.1.1.2.
Okay, but that doesn't really prove anything except that my PC can ping the server, that I've got IP connectivity to the server. I basically sent a message to the server saying, are you there? And the server replied back saying, yes, I'm here. So this server is there, but that doesn't really help us. What we wanna do is have a look at the services running on the server. And notice here are a whole bunch of services. We've got HTTP as an example. We've got DNS, which is domain name system. Basically allows me to resolve domain names such as google.com or facebook.com to an IP address. We've got other types of services here like email, FTP, and various other services. So on the HTTP service, I'm gonna leave this as on. That's the default. On the PC, if I close this command prompt down and open up a web browser, and let's browse using HTTP hypertext transfer protocol to the IP address of the server. What you'll notice is a web page displays. I can see a small web page here which says hello world. I can go back, I can go and look at an image page, and here's a Cisco logo. Now that doesn't really do much, but that's an example of a network. We've got a client on the left, a server on the right. The server is configured with the HTTP service, and it's serving a web page to the client when the client requested the web page. If I turn the service off, so I've turned it off now for HTTP, but it's on for HTTPS, HTTPS is once again just an encrypted version of hypertext transfer protocol, which is used for web browsing. I'll close this down, open it up again, try and go to HTTP 10.1.1.2. Now what will happen, and it might take it a while, is it will time out. And there you go. Notice it says request timed out. And that's because the server is no longer listening on port 80. It's not listening, so it just basically drops the traffic that you send to it. So if you send it a request saying, show me a web page on port 80, it just basically drops the request, ignores what, you, what you're what asking. If I go HTTPS, however, notice we get the web page because the server is listening on port 443 now, which is the port number used for HTTPS. I'll enable HTTP once again, and let's try and go to the server on port 80, and that's worked. So just to prove it, because that wasn't very clear, I'll open up a web browser again and manually type HTTP 10.1.1.2, and notice the web page displays. Now another great thing about Packet Tracer is we've got the simulation mode. If I select a simulation mode, I can actually see what's going on. So on the PC, and I'll just move this around so we can see what's going on. I'm gonna click go now, and what you'll notice is a packet has been sent into the network. Now there's a lot of information here, and I'll go through this in more detail when we talk about the OSI model and the TCP IP model. But what I'd like you to see is we've got a MAC address, which is the MAC address of the PC, sending traffic to the MAC address of the server, and we've got an IP address, which is the IP address of the PC, going to the IP address of the server. Source IP address is PC, destination IP address is the server. At layer two, here we've got an ethernet header. Source MAC address is the PC, destination MAC address is the server. Notice here we've got port 80. Port 80, once again, is the port number that the server is listening on. If we look at that in more detail, and don't get scared by this, this is just an example of the kind of data that's sent into the network. Wireshark will show you this in more detail than this, but this gives you an idea of what's going on. Source MAC address is the PC. Destination MAC address is the server. We've got source IP address PC. Destination IP address is the server. We're using IP version four here. We're also using a protocol called TCP or transfer control protocol. That basically just gives us reliability in a network transmission. So if you send 
something to a server and it gets lost, it'll be resent, retransmitted. So it gives us reliability, destination port number is 80. So when we send that into the network, that will be sent to the server and the server will receive that. And then what it'll do is send something back to the PC. So a packet gets sent back from the server to the PC with information. Notice the source port for the reverse traffic from the server to the PC is 80. Basically, the client talks to the server on port 80 and then the server replies back from port 80 to a port number that your client has randomly decided to use. Now that's a lot of information and I'm hoping it's not too overwhelming. The best thing you can do is install Packet Tracer and build a topology yourself and follow what I'm doing. There's no better way to learn than to do things yourself. One of my favorite analogies is riding a bicycle. I can talk about riding a bicycle, I can show you pictures, videos, etc. but until you yourself ride a bicycle, fall off a few times, struggle a bit, you'll never learn to ride a bicycle. Best way to learn is to just do it. So build this yourself and try it yourself.